If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about anomaly detection. So let's start with what are anomalies? Why do we need to do anomaly detection? Anomaly detection is the process of identifying rare events or outliers that deviate significantly from the norm in a data set. These anomalies can signal potential issues or interesting patterns in the data. So let's try to visually understand. So one way to identify anomalies could be through your domain knowledge. For example, let's say you're trying to predict the price of a car and the mileage is listed at zero. So you may say that's an anomaly because which car would have a mileage zero and why would somebody even buy it? Similarly, you're trying to work on a patient filter data and you have some unusual values related to a patient's weight, which really doesn't match the age. That's something which you understand from the domain side of it. But is there a way that we can look at some data and identify the anomalies? More importantly, is there a way that we can apply an algorithm and detect the anomalies? That's what we're going to focus on in this video. Let's just look at the data and try to understand what these anomalies could be. So let's say we have a common two-dimensional visualization where we have some data points like these and we have some unusual observations. These are also known as outliers extreme values in certain cases. Now we've done a separate video on outlier detection but in that video, we primarily focused on identifying the outliers with respect to each column. In a particular feature, if a value is unusual, we call it an outlier. Right now, when we are going to look at it, it will be from a broader perspective that we're looking at the entirety of the data and then trying to find out the unusual value. For example, in this visualization, if you see, these two points do not have a, an unusual Y value or the vertical axis you see because other points do attain that kind of a Y value. But these points seem to have an unusual X value in this case. There could also be a scenario where both the X and Y values are usual, still the points are somewhat different from the rest. So there are multiple possibilities and that's where we don't need to just look at it from one feature's perspective. We may want to look at it from the overall data's perspective. The limitation, however, would be that we cannot visualize a multi-dimensional data. Our visualization would always be limited to one or two dimensions. So is there a way that we can actually find out outliers or unusual values in the data without necessarily visualizing it? That's what we're going to focus on in the subsequent slides. Now, before we get into the technicality of things, let's understand where all it is applicable because it's something which is widely used and nowadays it's very commonly needed. So first application could be the application in cybersecurity. When it comes to cybersecurity, we have intrusion detection systems. Anomaly detection is used to identify unusual patterns in network traffic or system logs, indicating potential security breaches or malicious activity. These could also be used for user behavior analysis, wherein detecting the anomalies in user behavior could help identify compromised accounts or insider threats by analyzing deviations from typical usage patterns. The second application of anomaly detection could be in the area of fraud detection. When it comes to financial transactions, anomaly detection is applied to detect unusual patterns in financial transactions, helping to identify fraudulent activities such as credit card frauds, money laundering, or even identity theft. In case of insurance claims, data can be indicative of fraudulent claims prompting further investigation. And also in the case of healthcare applications, when we talk about a disease outbreak. Anomaly detection is used in epidemiology to identify unusual patterns in healthcare data that may indicate the emergence or outbreak of a disease or public health crisis. It could also be used for patient monitoring. Anomalies in patient vital signs or health records can help healthcare providers identify issues early and accordingly plan the right course of action while there is still time to recover the patient's health. So these are some broad applications of anomaly detection. Now let's move on to the techniques related to anomaly detection. So when it comes to outliers, we've already covered how to detect anomalies in a unidimensional data, taking one feature at a time. But here we're going to focus on a special technique that's known as the isolation forest. This leverages the power of decision trees to identify the unusual observations. And as we progress through the slides, we'll be discussing how this exactly works. The isolation forest is an anomaly detection algorithm that is particularly effective in identifying outliers or anomalies in a data set. Let's see how it works. So we all are familiar with the idea of generating trees. 
In case of isolation forest, it must have something to do with trees. That's why we are calling it a forest. So you're already familiar with an algorithm that's known as a random forest. It's very similar to a random forest, but there are a few differences that we'll call out. So we all know the idea of trees. It essentially takes a node and keeps on splitting the various nodes and tries to populate a tree which reaches an end result. In this case, the assumption is that if we have unusual observations, the tree should be able to isolate them at a much earlier stage. For example, in this case, if you see, this red point that's represented here is an outlier or an anomaly. And it was so easy to identify it right in the beginning, or at least much earlier in terms of depth compared to the other usual observations. Now, these trees that we use in isolation forest, of course, are not identical. Just like in random forest, the trees are not identical. If all the trees are identical, then there is no point doing a forest. We would rather do just one tree. So you'll have multiple trees. Let's say this is another tree that kind of grows. And the same data point that you see in the first tree at level one of split is something that you find at level two of split here. And so on and so forth, we create multiple trees, wherein a particular observation would be finding multiple places. But the whole idea is that an outlier observation or an unusual observation would be easily traceable without going too much into the depth of a tree. And if that's the case, then we can easily separate the unusual observations from the normal observation. So now I said there is a subtle difference between the kind of trees that you see here and the typical decision trees. So the tree that we use in case of isolation forest is known as the extra tree regressor. Extra here stands for extremely randomized. So just as in case of a normal decision tree, we use entropy or a genie gain to decide the nodes on which we want to do splits. In case of extremely randomized trees, we do these splits by choosing the nodes randomly. And that's why the position of the same observation might vary from tree to tree. Now let's look at the math behind this. There are a couple of terms that we need to understand and then we'll be sorted as to how this actually works. So essentially an isolation forest is able to generate an anomaly score for every data point. And certain data points above a threshold are named as outliers. Let's see how this works. So first of all, we compute the anomaly score for every data point. If it crosses a specific threshold, we consider it as outlier. Let's look at the mathematical formula for this. So the formula for this is two raised to the power negative of expected value of hx divided by c. Now what is this? So we are saying the score, the anomaly score is a function of two variables, x and m. Let's understand what these terms are. So m basically represents the number of points that we have. X is a particular data point. EHX represents the expected value or the average path length of the isolating data point X in a tree. And CM represents the average depth of data points in a tree. So let's understand this. What are these values and how these are captured? We'll have to go back to slide where we had these trees and then we can understand this a little better. So we are back at this slide. And if you see how many splits it took to reach this anomaly, it just took one split in this case. How many splits it took in this case to reach this anomaly? In this path, it took one split and two splits, and then we reached here. Again, in this case, it took just one split. So when we add all these values, that's one plus two plus one, and divided by the number of trees, that's what we call expected value of hx. And then what is the CM? So CM represents the average depth taking all the points present in a tree. So we have usual observations and we have some anomaly. We are trying to compare on an average, how is this anomaly across the forest compared to how these points are within a tree. So it is believed that these anomalies would be identified by much lesser splits compared to a kind of data, which is usual. Let's go back to the mathematical equation and understand how the score is generated and what to interpret out of it. So if you look at this equation, let's try to understand the relationship between the average path length for the point that has been isolated as an anomaly versus the average depth of all the data points in a tree. So if we have the E of HX much less than CM, then this function, which returns the anomaly score, tends to one. So you can imagine if this value is much less, which means the value in the denominator is much higher. So you have a small value divided by a much larger value, this would almost become zero. This power becomes zero irrespective of the sign, negative or positive, two raised to the power zero, that's going to be one. And likewise, if we have this EHX much greater than CM, 
then what happens? Then we have a pretty high power of a number which is greater than one. And this is with a negative sign, which means now this value overall would tend to zero. In a way, you can write it as one by two raised to a pretty high power. So if when a fraction is raised to a very high power, it will always tend to zero. And when this E of HX is equal to CM, these two values are equal, which simply means that the depth at which an anomaly is found is the same as that of a normal data point. Of course, in this case, the score that we'll get would be 0.5. So generally, if the anomaly score for a data point is greater than 0.5, we will consider it an anomaly. The closer to one it is, the stronger the anomaly. The closer to zero, it's more likely to be a very normal data point. In fact, anything less than 0.5 would generally be treated as a normal data point.